Zoom can also hear. So I'll go ahead and uh, introduce my uh, dear uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Laura Tafe. I'll wait on the people to walk in. Okay, so uh, Dr. Taif is an associate professor at uh, Dartmouth School of Medicine, uh, and she uh, serves in many roles uh, there, but I think uh, on the national scene, uh, she is a leader in uh, the Association of Molecular Pathology, had uh, led the solid tumor, I believe, div uh, division for a while, and now she's the president of AMP. And uh, that's not a small task. Uh, so uh, uh, for uh, uh, someone who's only uh, 10 years ago, probably a little more, came out of fellowship, uh, it's an amazing, amazing achievement. Uh, Laura, uh, and I may call her that, uh, she's a friend of mine, is... Uh, is a, a superb molecular pathologist, but also a superb uh, anatomic pathologist so with interest in GYN uh, pathology. I think she also does uh, some lung. So after uh, doing her residency uh, at Dartmouth and her chief residency, uh, she went to uh, New York uh, at Sloan Kettering and did a couple of fellowships, one in oncologic surgical path and uh, one in molecular uh, genetic pathology, uh, which she is boarded in both uh, specialty. She's a prolific uh, author. She has over 100 publications. Uh, 90% of them are uh, first and last uh, authorship or co-authorship original articles. Uh, but uh, she is uh, a consummate uh, teacher, a very, uh, an amazing educator. And, and uh, as you're gonna uh, gather in her talk, uh, a very multifaceted uh, pathologist. Uh, when she asked me, uh, should I do uh, an art? I, I welcome the idea. Uh, we, uh, uh, pathology has a lot to do with art and I, I'm sure she's gonna touch upon that. I still remember during my residency, looking at uh, the first uh, case of uh, a polyp, Hughes Jager uh, type polyp, I don't know what they call it now, but uh, a hamartomatous type polyp, and it looks like a tree branching. And I remember my mentor then saying, can you believe they pay us to do this? And he was uh, raving about the picture, which is, which is true. So we're fortunate in PATH. And uh, now uh, it's getting even more and more colorful with a lot of additional stains and techniques that we do. So uh, without overdue, uh, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have uh, Laura. We've been trying to get her here uh, for several things. And uh, maybe after she visited uh, UAB and uh, if we can impress her with the food uh, uh, in, uh, in Birmingham, maybe we can uh, make her consider. But even for given a grand round, uh, it took us three years. Of course, the pandemic uh, is what delayed. So we're so glad you're here and the floor of yours to uh, talk about reimagining the gap, interconnection of art, narrative, and pathology. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Neto, and thank you very much for coming this morning, afternoon, lunchtime. Um, I just gonna start with this photo. This was my yard yesterday morning before I came. So we, on, on Tuesday, we got about eight inches of snow. Um, that's my crazy dog running around. Uh, so it was a beautiful, clear morning. Luckily the snow cleared up before I had to travel. So I was able to make it here um, without any issues. Not advancing. Okay, there we go. So these are my objectives because I was required to have objectives. Um, but really, despite everything that was just said about me on my CV, um, I want to remind you that I'm much more than my CV, as are all of you. Um, I'm a human, first and foremost, and that's really what I want to talk about is some of the things that are um, fascinating me and important to me besides pathology, but are connected to pathology. And I'm really speaking from my own experiences. Um, I will be mentioning mental health and I will mention suicide if that's a concern for anyone. I just wanted to bring that, um, mention that. I'm trained as an MD and I work as an anatomic pathologist. And so that's kind of my frame of mind is that um, I, I love pathology. Pathology is very visual and aesthetic to me. And that's mostly speaking from the anatomic side of myself. 
Um, and I wanted to start by bringing us kind of all here together to look at an image and kind of think about what it says to you and uh, just take a minute to um, think about what you would describe this as, or if I would love if anyone would call out what they what they see and um, what they think about this. This is a Frida Kahlo uh, portrait or painting. And as you may or may not know, uh, she's a very well-known painter. She has many of her paintings are self-portraits. Um, and she has this long history, or she had a long history of chronic, chronic pain and chronic illness, which is often reflected in her work. And um, this one, as I was kind of going through pictures that I wanted to share today, this one kind of caught my attention. And I haven't seen this one so often, um, but I thought it was very impactful. And I wondered if anyone would care to offer some thoughts about what they see. Yes. She seems very stoic to me. Yeah. That you have of the branch kind of following along in the time person. Branch what down? The, the branch in the foreground. Uh, so those on you who are Zoom maybe can't hear, she's mentioning the branch on the foreground, how it looks like it's fallen down or it's been possibly cut off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's very, very strong, perhaps. Um, the comment was that she's stuck, she was struck by many arrows, but she's still standing. Um, and if, if you don't know her personal history, as a young girl, she had polio, which left her partly with a limp on one side. And then when she was a young woman, she was in a, a very major trolley accident where she was basically um, partially impaled and broke her pelvis and had chronic pain and back surgery all her life because of that. And so she experienced multiple surgeries and having that history, I kind of imagine that these arrows possibly are kind of aligned like that along her spine. Um, she also had a very tumultuous personal life um, with uh, her partner, Diego Rivera, who's also another artist as well. So um, anyone else want to say anything else here? Yeah. From an art historical perspective, I think that she's also uh, hearkening to the uh, St. Stephen martyrdom paintings where there's a lot of stoicism and a bunch of arrows with someone sort of still standing there. So there's, yeah, uh, she, she's making allusions. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for offering that. That was my question, too. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of teal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for participating in this exercise. And I, I think it's a nice example, too, that all of us can see a little bit different things and have different ways of interpreting what we see. Um, and also, someone might make a connection to a prior story that you're not aware of, and that brings in a whole nother interpretation of what you're actually seeing and how you experience a piece of work. So thank you for taking the time to do that with me. And I wanna start here with um, actually a case presentation. So this was a patient who I had the pathology from um, about 2017. She was a 68 year old woman with a history of breast cancer. And uh, she presented with um, a retroorbital headache, and eventually she progressed to have diplopia and um, some uh, CN nerve palsy as well. And this is her radiology. You can see on MR, she had this uh, lesion within the retroclival bone, um, and it extended um, into an anatomic space is very hard to get to and very hard to anatomically, um, surgically do anything with. So we were able to get a biopsy um, and this is her biopsy. And anyone want to give your impression based on the findings? Does this help you?
Excuse me. <laughs> Anybody? Come on. <laughs> I don't. I'll take anyone. Yay! Yes, it means sarcoma. So that's this is her diagnosis, which is incredibly rare in this anatomic location. Um, and in, in follow-up, this is what I knew about her. She underwent induction therapy and radiation, and she was essentially free of disease. Um, and she even gave her permission to write a case report about her, her findings. Um, and this is, this is pretty much um, all I knew about this patient, as, as are most of our patients. Um, and I bring her up because there are some patients that stick with us, and it, either it's a name or a diagnosis or... Um, something about their history and your interaction with their case, and they stay with you like forever. <laughs> and she was one of these patients for me. Um, but but I had the the feeling too that oftentimes I kind of I'm the one getting lost to follow up as a pathologist because we make the diagnosis and then the patient goes on to um, see their surgeons or their oncologists, and essentially we we don't know necessarily what their follow-up cares or their courses, unless we get a rebiopsy um, or something happens down the, ro down the road. And so this is this kind of um, a thought that, that I have been thinking about lately is that I don't have much interaction with these patients and I'm gonna talk about her again. So, so just remember this case. Um, and I wanted to talk about my why as to why I'm actually talking about bringing up this topic. Um, perhaps, it, perhaps it's a little unconventional to speak on art and in this context, um, but it's something that's very valuable to me, particularly right now in my life. Um, I grew up basically as a science and art lover, and that's something that I did all through high school. And as I got into college, I kind of felt the pressures of you have to choose one or the other. You you can't kind of do both. And um, and so obviously I kind of went more of the science route. And then I um, ended up taking two years off before medical school and fortunately discovered pathology during that time. And my first pathology mentor was a pathologist who had in his previous life been a philosopher and he was also a writer. And he really kind of renewed in me that, that sense that a doctor, a physician could really be a multifaceted person. So that's re maintained as a value to me. Um, and then I go off to medical school, and of course, uh, it's it's so busy. Training is is very challenging, as you know. Those who have done it in any context of that kind of um, secondary training can be very consuming. Um, I also had a young family; I had two kids during my training, um, and so there wasn't much time for me or myself during all of that. And things like art really got pushed aside, and um, and, and you know, you kind of do that as survival mode, but I also feel like medical training um, encourages us to disassociate a little bit with some of those things. Um, it can be a little bit dehumanizing at times too, as we go through these really long hours and these rituals of training. Um, and so essentially uh, two things happened. One, um, in 2014, my mother died suddenly. She was killed in a car accident. And that kind of spun me off into this cycle of grief and depression. Um, and one of my responses to that also was throwing myself into my work. Um, and so that proceeded for a couple of years. And then in 2019, I was kind of at a breaking point where I felt like I was burnt out. I wasn't really loving what I love anymore, um, which is probably depression and burnout talking. And so uh, I kind of was thinking the last few years, what was I missing? Um, and one of the things that I've always been attracted to was art. And so that came up to me again. And in 2019, I just suddenly decided like, I have, I have to do this. I have this need. It was essentially, I couldn't live without it. Um, and that's when I really started prioritizing making art. And so um, that's my story. That's my why as why I'm bringing that to you here, because I'm, I'm not surprised if other people don't have things like that, that they've loved once that they kind of pushed aside or forgot about. And maybe you need to re rediscover those. 
Um, and part of this also, I think, is that we, we need to remind ourselves that we're all interconnected. Um, of course, we're, there's ourselves as individuals, there's you as my colleagues, there's us as healthcare workers, there's all these collaborations we do within our own disciplines, within other disciplines, and there's our patients, of course, too. Um, and this was one of my one of my collages that I I just wanted to share at this point because it um, is one for me of of hope, which is kind of what I want to offer to you at this time. So um, thinking about why I think this is important for you and for us as as healthcare workers, I think um, this applies to us as both as individuals and also in our role in healthcare. Um, our itself can be an excellent and amazing form of self-expression. Um, it can be a lot of experimentation. It gives you a chance to mess around and fail, which we're not always good at learning how to fail. Um, so it's a good place to fail and experiment. Um, you can express your opinions about things. You can, um, it can be a coping mechanism, a form of therapy, um, many, many things. So I think for you as an individual, if you have an interest in art, there are many benefits to that. Um, and also, that, and that's the context of making art. And if you are a maker and a creator, I want to remind you that sharing is optional. So I, I never shared my art for a really long time. <laughs> And then finally, a couple of people I felt comfortable enough to start sharing with, um, and now I'm much more comfortable doing that too. So our our brains are our our, our brains are are very powerful, and this is how we intake the world, obviously. And I'm putting. I wanted to ask you to think about um, a scenario in which you really love engaging with art. Maybe it's a concert. Um, maybe it's going to a theater or going to the museum for me. Um, I put the, the Surratt up here because it was going to the Art Institute of Chicago and seeing this um, picture for the first time when I was 15. And, and think about the sensations that you might have of feeling like you're connected to something larger than yourself, connected to maybe the people you're sitting around, um, you're engaging your senses, you're thinking about, you're feeling emotions in this whole um, experience as well. Um, and empathy, I think, as well as a part of it. And um, those are all really healthy things to experience. And our brain really likes that experience as well. Um, and there is a lot to be said about those being features that we also use in our lives as anatomic pathologists, such as uh, focusing our attention, observing contrast, and creating metaphor and meaning and story and building connections um, in our work. And neuroscience and neuroaesthetics has been delving into this. This is a, a recent publication, How the Brain Creates Your Taste in Art, which I thought was really kind of fascinating. Um, they use neural networks in order to actually map people's act areas of activity in the brain when they see different art. Um, and some, you know, like the particular areas, when if you like a piece of art, it lights up in one region and so on and so forth. So it's a really fascinating um, article, or I offer you to, to read it if you'd like to investigate more. But I think these things are, these are thinking about how do we actually show a benefit of art um, can be really challenging. And um, there's a, a, a division of John Hopkins called Impact Thinking, which I just learned about. It's, a, it's trying to do clinical trial-based research looking at um, art as um, as being in, engaged in part of patient care and in the larger community. So these are just two examples of a, a library book program and an example of music in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, I also think it's important to uh, remind us that we, we are, as a healthcare community, we are suffering from some mental health concerns. Uh, these are some statistics from Medscape. And I think, um, they're, they're very sobering, I think, for, for me to see these. Um, so about 50, over 50% 50 of, of physicians noticed that they were burnt out and about quarter said they were actually depressed. And um, pathologists are among those. The, we, were, we were ranking about 40% who said we were burnt out and um, particularly strong in women as well. And in terms of mental health too, um, we have a, a lot of, 
we know we have a lot of uh, issues with depression and um, concerns about that. And interestingly, the number one cause given for depression was job burnout. So the two are obviously closely interrelated. Um, and there remains a stigma about actually talking about their healthcare needs um, for physicians and other, other healthcare providers. Um, this really kind of highlights some of these things. It says depression says something negative about me. I worry that people will think less of my professional abilities. I fear that the medical boards or employer will find out and so on and so forth. So there's still a lot of stigma and shame around um, mental health, particularly in our, in our, in our um, healthcare society. Um, also, there are high levels of, of suicide, as you may be aware. This is the survey about suicidal ideation and suicidal thoughts. And um, fascinatingly, pathology was ranked at the top. Um, this was out of about 260 physicians who participated, pathologists that participated out of 13,000 um, physicians overall. So I think these, these findings are very sobering to me that, um, that, that there is really kind of a mental health crisis within her field. And it's something that we don't speak a lot about, um, but, I, but I think it's really important. I know for me and, and my dealing with depression, um, becoming engaged with art was something that has helped me. Um, it's given me more meaning in my life outside of just my professional identity. identity. And um, I, I love it, it's creative, it's fun. So, um, there are two tools that have been developed, to, particularly in mind with um, healthcare. Uh, one, are, one is in narrative medicine, and the other is the visual thinking strategies. Have Have you heard of either of these or experienced any interaction with them? Yes and no. Okay. Um, both Both of them overall have these two goals. So, sorry, the two overall have these goals. Um, they involve close observation, strong communication, developing critical thinking and empathy, implicit bias are um, questioned and raised, listening skills, interpretation. Uh, they use tools of personal reflection to process our own experiences. And um, one of the things that I think is, is really interesting is this increased tolerance to ambiguity. Uh, particularly um, those of us in healthcare, we know like when we make a diagnosis, we don't always know where to put something and we deal with a lot of ambiguity in our work, I believe. And so um, just to tell you a little bit more about narrative medicine, um, I, I have, I'm not an expert by any means, I participated in one uh, weekend workshop on narrative medicine. And some of the philosophy is that we can utilize literature um, in order to do these types of close readings and reflective thinking. And the scenario that I was in is we had a relatively small group of people. We all shared in reading the same poem, for instance. Um, and then we had a facilitator that asked us discussions and we each kind of contributed uh, what we thought about things. So kind of like the, the Frida Kahlo piece that we just, we just talked about. Um, everyone shared a slightly different opinion and interpretation of the work, which was really fascinating. And actually I found very helpful for myself to kind of see how other people's thoughts evolved and other people's thoughts worked in this particular context. Um, and so narrative medicine has been used quite a bit in the, the situation of um, healthcare provider to patient interaction. And so, um, and there, there's, there are studies supporting that this does have overall benefit, particularly with communication and empathy and building those sorts of um, relationships. And so, uh, you know, one of my questions is how can narrative, can it and should it be, inter um, integrated into pathology a little bit more? Is it a tool that might be useful for us? Um, the visual thinking strategies is essentially kind of the same concept, but using a visual piece of art. So what about our, our patients and, and our connection to our patients um, as pathologists? Um, there was a project in 2016 that um, Dr. B at, at uh, Moffitt participated in, and this was a sarcoma patient who who left this quote, um, and he says that my pathologist at Moffitt, um, Dr. Bui, was gracious in showing me my pathology slides and provided me with digital images of the tumor histology. 
She has stepped out of the shadows of the lab and made me realize that pathologists are an integral part of the team and are vital to patient care. Um, and I really love this quote because it, it really embraces that dynamic and relationship between pathologists and patients in a, in a unique way. Um, and this particular patient was also an artist and it was very valuable for him to see his own histology, his own slides. And he actually incorporated them into his artwork um, as a form of kind of expressing his re reaction and his relationship with this diagnosis. And so this is, I think, a really interesting and powerful way that um, pathologists could potentially interact with patients and also be healing for a patient too, having the opportunity to actually see what they're facing. So this patient, my patient, um, I, I hadn't thought about her for a while. And then um, being, being the collage artist that I am, I'm always scavenging for paper. So everywhere I go, I kind of have a lookout for, can I pick this up? Can I cut it up? Can I, can I use it in my collages? Um, so one day I was walking around the hospital and um, down by the cancer center and I picked up a, a booklet that, is, um, that I didn't even know this program existed, but it was, it was a program for arts for patients. And um, I did not show my particular patient's artwork because I wasn't sure if I should. So I, I, in doubt, I switched it out. But this is her story. Um, in, this, in her comment, I, so I flipped open the book and there was her name. And I'm like, I have not thought about this patient for a couple of years. And I, every once in a while, she comes up in my mind and I wonder what's happened to her. Um, and her, her picture was of a boot that she had drawn as part of this program. And her story that she shared was that I chose to commemorate the time following our son on a thousand mile Yukon Quest dog sled race. This is a sketch of the boot I wore trekking around the towns where the racers reported in. It was a wonderful time. I was so lucky to be there. And she also said, drawing always seemed like something others could do and not me. <laughs> and I honestly, I just got this gut wrenching feeling in a good way of she's alive. And she has a story. And just reading that, I knew that she had a whole life. And that was very touching to me. And um, I really appreciated having that opportunity and experience to, that she has no idea ever happened um, with this particular patient. And I think all these things we've been talking about can be very beneficial to us in our collaborations. It, it brings us um, a lot of skills that are, are, are definitely valued as part of our collaborative efforts, um, both in the academic arena as well as in some other areas of our lives. So um, flexibility of thought, this ability to build connections and to listen to other people's ideas and perspectives. Um, it also gives us some confidence in doing something that um, we might not do in our day-to-day -day life, but it, it gives us a new confidence that we have this other part of ourselves that we are developing. It can support our personal and professional identity and meaning as well as uh, reflect our values. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about two collaborations that I've been a part of that have come up simply on social media because I started sharing my artwork. Um, I've been reached out to about both of these and they're, they're both becoming very fruitful efforts and, and, and really neat. So this first is the Woman Physician Artist Consortium. Um, and it was founded the end of last year and it consists of about 40 artists. Um, the two founders are an ER physician and a surgical resident. And we have monthly virtual uh, meetings to share art and talk about what we're working on. And um, also we have decided as a group to have a, a, a monthly prompt that we'll each respond to. And so our first month we did gallbladder and these were the responses to gallbladder. And you can see how very vastly different each of us interprets them. Um, and I think the, uh, the second one, sorry, the second one on the left I think that was with the Dolly, um, so the Dolly prompt to do <laughs> AI images. So there's not a lot of good gallbladders for sourcing for, for teaching Dolly right now. Um, but it's fascinating to see how we do things so differently and how each of us has a different perspective and interpretation. Um, so this has been, I think, really a wonderful, fruitful 
collaboration of just bringing um, people together with similar interests and, and similar backgrounds and also kind of pushing each other to think about doing things a little bit differently too. Um, and the second one is a, a book that will be coming out later this year, which is called Artists Remaking Medicine. Um, and really the overall objective of this book was to talk to artists, architects, musicians, color theorists, illustrators, physicians, technologists, even a puppeteer, and um, give us all, all a chance to talk about um, how we, we saw opportunities to change medicine. And um, this is a really fascinating perspective. The, the kind of the, the task given to me was to think about in the context of architecture. Um, and these are two illustrations from a, a group from the 1970s called Super Studio, who was an architect group in Italy. And mostly they made collages and a lot of them had to do with healthcare and building design. And so that was, those are the prompts that were given to me. And these are two of my collages that I've included. Um, one is called Compassion and the other Community to try to incorporate some of that art, nature, I mean, building nature um, <laughs> communion together. And um, the story of compassion comes from when I was in the narrative medicine workshop, we had um, a chance to talk to each other. And there was a, a, a woman who had been a, a breast cancer patient. And she, she told a story about how her nurse had applied chapstick to her lips when her lips were so dried and chapped um, during her treatment when she was an inpatient. And how much this meant to her of this such a small act of noticing and compassion. And she also mentioned how she feels like um, that healthcare workers deserve to have compassion given back to them by their patients. And that was important to her to say as well. And so that's where this collage compassion kind of arose from that story that I heard from that particular person. Those were some other ones. All right. So kind of transition away from those. Um, and let's talk a little bit about some of the tools that we can have uh, for education that might be art-based. Um, and as we know, of course, anatomy and medicine has a very long history of illustrations. And I just wanted to highlight three particular artists slash physicians um, because I thought their, their stories were interesting. So the first was Robert Carswell, who was born in Scotland. And he was one of the first pathologists who um, I believe was called College University of London is ultimately where he worked. And he was a very gifted artist and he was commissioned to illustrate the pathology of disease because there weren't really great illustrations for that. Um, and he mentioned that there was great difficulty and frequently impossibility of comprehending even the best descriptions of physical or anatomic character, characters of disease without the aid of color delineations. And so he amended that. He made about a thousand watercolor um, paintings in order to illustrate pathologic disease. And they're really beautiful. Um, the second, of course, is Cajal, who... Um, is one of our first neuroscientists, neuroanatomists. Um, and it sounds like there's a, a story that when he was an eight-year-old boy, he was um, highly independent and um, would go off and kind of disappear and draw birds. He would just follow around and draw birds. And then he taught himself photography. And so he's always a very artistic child. And his father was a physician and encouraged him towards medicine and actually um, got him into medical illustration. And that was kind of what he used to convince Cajal to become a physician, um, in which, of course, we know he produced such beautiful illustrations of, of, of neurons and, um, of, and they're so reminiscent sometimes of nature structures, of sea anemones, perhaps, of trees. Um, they're just very beautiful pen and ink or pencil drawings. And then the third, the good Dr. Gleason, who um, described, as we know, the very important histologic patterns mm -hmm. of prostate cancer. So Dr. Gleason worked in Minnesota at the VA department and GU for a number of years. Um, and he was a military doctor to begin with. And he actually took two years to go study art in Paris. If you ever, <laughs> I never knew that, but I've learned that. 
so he, he had apparently always had a love for art. Um, and then he came back from Paris and became this pathologist. So he had a great eye in observation. And um, that's the story of Gleason. So there are um, some changes, I think, that have been recognizing the value of art in medicine and, and medical education. Um, there are some recommendations that came out from the AAMC um, a few years ago, and I don't know um, how they're coming down the pipeline yet, but they, they do exist. They are um, encouraging more embracing of some of these techniques, such as narrative medicine and observation into medical training. At um, Dartmouth, um, just to tell you a few things that we're doing or that I'm aware of that we're doing at the medical school. Um, we have a health and human humanity scholar uh, for medical students. And um, I think it's, it's a relatively small program, I believe, that uh, is focused on trying to enrich the experience of those particular students who have that keen interest in continuing um, art, music, et cetera, in their training. And we also have a literary journal called The Lifelines. And I'm not sure I tried to find out if your medical school had a literary journal and I couldn't find one. So um, maybe they do and it might be something worth looking into. And then our institution also has an annual arts and humanities and medicine symposium, which is virtual and um, was quite fascinating this past year. In terms of what we're doing at DH for resident education and kind of across the country, there's extremely paucity of literature on this. Um, I try to find out more details of what's happening in terms of pathology kind of focused or related uh, teaching and use of art and I, there's really not much out there. So one thing that we've done at our institution is have our residents make clay models as part of their AP orientation and then learn how to gross them. So that's a, that's a pretty hands-on way to incorporate the, the use of, of art and sculpture into their training. But otherwise there isn't very much happening. Um, and so I looked to some of the other societies, um, or, or sorry, I wanted to talk about this one first. So it's actually a really interesting publication um, that came out of, of the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. And they are designed this game for their residents called Pathology Pyramid. Um, do any of you remember the pyramid games? Yeah, I, I never saw them, um, but essentially one person knows what they're trying to describe and the other person has to guess. And so um, in this particular format, they uh, designed a game for pathology residents where in order to try to improve um, communication and team building and their descriptive skills. And I don't know about you residents, but as a resident, I hated the slide conferences <laughs> where I had to be the one who had to speak about them. Um, and so you know, this was, they thought maybe this would be an approach that would be more palatable to some of the residents and really focus on building camaraderie and teamwork in a fun situation. Um, and uh, they, their, their uses were um, different, different histology images and the resident had to describe them. Um, and then their team had to try to guess what they were describing. And there was also a facilitator there that would help prompt with questions. And also, and then finally, once they um, came up with an answer, there would be a time to give feedback. And the residents felt that this was very helpful in honing their descriptive skills over time. And they, um, months later, they continued to do this. And several months later, residents recall um, things that they had learned during that particular session. So it has been very helpful. And this is really kind of the only um, resident education related to art and description and visual learning that I could find related to pathology. Um, there are a couple of reviews about education in art and surgical um, training. And this particular one talks about kind of four scenarios. They looked from like the early 1970s to 2022, and they only found 13 articles that were relevant to their search criteria of training surgical residents with art techniques. Um, and the four most common reasons or util utilizations were using uh, pre and post operative drawing to enhance surgical learning, formal art training during residency to help document and communicate about operations, particularly in the context of um, giving or getting consent and having that conversation with a patient. 
Um, they, and they also found a study that showed that drawing and sculpting can be a useful evaluative tool to make sure that the residents are understanding and what they're learning and they can um, reflect that back. Uh, and then exercises in art observation and visual analysis um, can be utilized to help with empathy, well being, and interprofessional co cooperation. Um, and then this is a uh, another example in surgery. So this was a this is actually a randomized clinical trial that one of my colleagues in the um, women's art artist consortium physician artist consortium is a part of, and she's a surgical resident at the pediatric hospital, and she noticed that. Um, there wasn't really great literature to give families as they were consenting for surgical procedures. And so she started to write and paint these little um, little books, essentially, um, talking about, you know, what exactly is happening, what is the surgical procedure, kind of what happens post-surgery. And she uses these really clever analogies in order to communicate that. And this particular study used it, used randomized, was randomized so that um, two to one, so that a proportion of the families received the books and another proportion didn't. And overall, the outcome was that those who had received the books felt that they had much better satisfaction, comprehension, and much lower anxiety, and were able to retain information over time about what was happening to their, their, their child as part of surgery. So I thought this was a really, really clever and interesting way to think about patient education and communicating with patients through art. These are a little bit up close of two of her books. Appendicitis, One Angry Worm, G-Tubes, Fuel Me Up. So very cute and clever, and they're all hand-drawn watercolors. Um, so as we come to the end of this talk, I just wanted to uh, you know, remind us that there are, I think, many opportunities for us as individuals and also as in healthcare, because I think those are separate but connected um, in order to utilize narrative art and, and share our stories. Um, I think that there are, there are a lot of great works going on out there. Um, I love Dr. Williams' podcast, looking at diversify and pathology. It's really fantastic to hear other people's stories. I, I absolutely love it. And there are other efforts such as the Nocturnus and more than I can think of at the moment that are also doing similar things around, um, around our experience as physicians. Uh, I think perhaps reflective writing might be something that, that might be useful for uh, trainees and of course ourselves. But I was thinking, you know, I did when I did medical school, I spent four months in Detroit at the ME's office. And I don't think anyone ever asked me, how do you feel after seeing this crime scene? Um, or how do you feel after doing this autopsy? Um, I, those, ex those questions just haven't been asked. And I think maybe we should be asking them. Um, I think though the overall goal is to not add something else performative that we need to check off the list. I, that's not the goal here. Um, the goal here is to empower people and have healthier people. Um, I wanted to close with a couple more images of my art. And I don't know if this will work. Yeah, this is a video. <laughs> the video I made while making the compassion collage um, just to show my process. I use an exacto knife and um, that's my very ugly work area that's always chaos. So anyway, that's fun. The, the, uh, the wheel. The wheel. Yeah. Oh, well. The wheel. Oh, I can't show it now. The wheel is like a graph paper. Um, so it's like a, a graph paper wheel. Um, so as part of that, I incorporated quite a bit of or some graph paper as part of that. And yes. What does that mean? The the graph paper was brought in as part of the um, as part of these the my my inspiration was given as the super studio with the architecture and they also used a lot of, of graph paper and images as part of their work. So I uh, pulled some of that in from them. All right. And they're all paper, and then I photographed them. 
And these are a few that are, most of them are non-medical, um, but I do, I've done a couple of medical, like I shared. Um, and these were three that were in the Lifelines journal, the literary journal for Dartmouth Medical School. <laughs> you can talk to me after. Um, <laughs> oh, the ideas. Well, sure. There's always places for inspiration to start. Um, and uh, let's see a couple of things as we wrap up. I I, I saw this quote. Um, this there was a short editorial in the Pathologist magazine that we that we get in our mailboxes or emails, and this was about when art intimidates medicine imitates medicine. Um, and I really love this quote from Dr. Hay at NYU Long Island. He says, if you pay attention when studying and practicing medicine, you'll find that there are often echoes and clues to be found in the humanities literature and sociology. You may find that you can learn not only from classes and textbooks, but also from people and things you might never expect. After all, I learned about the pathology of Proteus syndrome, a rare and unique de disease, not from a textbook, but from my son's movie review, The Elephant Man. In life and work, knowledge and stories are everywhere. You just need to keep your eyes open. I thought that was a beautiful summary. And so in conclusion, thank you for <laughs> spending this time with me. And um, humoring me and listening to these these thoughts I've been have that I've been having. Um, I hope they've planted maybe some seeds and will inspire some conversation and some thought. And I think overall, at least for me, I've kind of come down to overall, everything kind of comes down to this, perhaps um, our, that defining our values helps us know our priorities, which is what drive our actions and ultimately, hopefully we become flourishing people. So it's kind of where I hope we go. Um, and this also changes throughout our life and it needs constant reevaluation and repeating. So it's always iterative. You're never, you're never there. And um, finally, I wanna thank you um, again and also acknowledge my friends and colleagues who inspire me, encourage me every day. Um, that's why I'm here. So thank you very much. And one more thing before everyone jumps up, um, I made 40 pieces of collage to share. I think we give the trainees priority of picking a piece, but then the rest of you may. And if you want one and there aren't any, please maybe give Keisha or Dr. Neto your name and I'll make more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've had our share of uh, burnout and depression. So that uh, this is not any more, uh, more uh, timely for us. Thank you. Thank you. Ben? I have a, a couple of comments, actually. Um, one, there is an, I don't know if it's a full publication, there's an abstract about narrative writing being used in autopsy rotations. Oh, cool. Somewhere out there, I've heard it, seen it. Um, and it and it did uh, very a very good positive outcome. I'll look for it. The second comment um, is I just wanted since we have a whole group here, I wanted everyone to know that the arts and medicine program at UAB is is very very good. Um, Balan organized a few uh, events this past year. There's an art and medicine poet um, Salam Green that is absolutely cool. phenomenal. That will do a number of narrative um, experiences like that for for groups. And I forgot the third one, so I'm sure I'll think about it. <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful to know. Uh, question for you. What is a color theory? I've heard this one. I'm not familiar with it. Color theory? Theory of color. Color theory. Could it be a color theory? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm, not sure. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what context that was in. So. Um, you talked about a group of, it's like a multidisciplinary approach. And you have people from different backgrounds completing color theory. Oh, oh, it's about the publication, the the artistry making medicine book. Um, I think color theorists. I don't know that this is correct, but it's it's my. I this is what I think. I think it's uh, about using color, such as like in a hospital room, using particular colors to create emotion and experience. So I believe that's related to what what they're what they're 
getting out for color theorists in that context. I mean, I have this, um, the, the article that you talked about that says that pathologists seem to have a higher rate of suicide ideation. Did they say anything about why that is? No, it doesn't. It's um, it's it's a Medscape publication. If you Google it, you can find it. And um, they didn't particularly give any reasons for that. Um, and and perhaps out of thirteen thousand physicians, about two hundred and sixty of them were pathologists, and pathologists was the highest out of out of that group. Um, so it might not be completely representative of pathology, but that's that was their data. Yeah. I don't know that I'm the one to answer that because I don't know all the studies to that. Um, I I know th things that we've tried to do at my institution. Um, we do have like the wellness efforts. Um, some of those include things like um, there is an arts program to bring arts programs to the to our department and bring you know paper and colored things to play with and and have that as like a lunchtime or downtime or or just a space where people can come and kind of have hands-on time with some art materials that's separated from them. Um, I think on a, on a personal level, you can um, do your own writing and reflecting and ideally think about what are the things that you love in your life? I think art is a very, art and narrative are very wonderful tools, but there are also many other things that could be your thing that is what you need. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's exercise, maybe it's anything else, you know? Um, so I think as personal reflection, it's also asking those questions of, of what are things that you love in your life that you feel would enhance your life that you would like to have more of, yeah. There are two comments in the chat. I guess since Brian was yeah, I remembered my third. I, I do. I, yeah, I love this stuff. So um, my third comment was that if anyone is interested in gamification as an education tool, that is a big push in medical school education and residency education right now. I'm happy to have to talk about it. And the second was to talk to Blonde's point. So there's a lot of talk about resiliency and burnout and vicarious trauma in medical legal death investigation communities. And something that was just presented this week was called a drawing wall. And so um, we've talked about a mural before, but something where there's a blank space that has either a, some sort of drawing um, picture on it, and it's just mindfulness. So if somebody just needs to stop by and color in a square or color portion of the drawing wall, just to collect some time and, and have some um, moment to check out that it works actually very well in the workplace. That's an awesome idea. Can you address the yep. this? All right. Yeah, so the first comment was about the police getting into coma. Um, Frida has two comments. <laughs> For those of us who have absolutely no artistic ability is our hope, of course. And I wish she was here because I really wanted to meet her. Um, <laughs> I think it has nothing to do with having any artistic ability. I think if you want to create something, you just create it. I don't put aside what other judgments you've ever been told about your artistic ability and just start playing. Um, there are many people who have taken up painting and et cetera when they're later in life and love it. It doesn't have anything to do with artistic ability. It has to do with taking time for yourself and self-expression and playing and having fun and exploring. So that's my answer to that. Um, more seriously, we are incredibly focused now on resident and fellow well-being, yet I feel that the rest of us are overlooked. How do we change the system and avoid burnout and unhappiness? Um, and I, I think something I wanted to, I love this question because I think that's a really key point um, that burnout is not about us as the people, it's about systems that don't support us as people. Um, and so I don't have an answer for that because obviously there's no easy answer for that, but I totally agree that um, systems need changing and that might mean 
more people doing the same amount of work so we can have more relief. Um, it might also mean making some personal boundaries. For instance, I do not have my work email on my cell phone. It's not allowed. If I need it, I'll log in. I don't have it on my personal phone. Um, things like that, uh, logging out at the end of the day, of course, maybe chairs can't do that, but <laughs> some of us can um, still kind of put those things aside and make space for ourselves away. And I think it's also, um, to some extent, it's also asking your colleagues how they are. Um, even those little bits of connection can be really helpful to kind of feel like you're part of a community and a camaraderie and not completely alone in your own misery some days. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. After the